to study trust and how it impacts us and impacts our our clients. Uh, so I know that we're going to have a, a great discussion this morning. Uh, we'll open up with Ben Boyd, who's our chief client officer, uh, who will give an overview of the trust findings for this year. And then uh, we will have a panel discussion for probably 30 to 40 minutes. And then we'll open it up if we have time for a Q&A session at the very end. So with that, I'd like to invite Ben up to kick off our discussion. Great. Thank you, Will. Thanks. Good morning. Um, it's great to be in the city of roses, um, which I just looked up to figure out why it was called that. Anybody? 1889, the Rose Society was founded. It was decided that 20 miles of roses should be planted in advance of the Lewis and Clark exposition that was to happen in 1905. There you go. That's my value add for you this morning. Um, now I can sit down. Right? Um, so yesterday, I went through 40 slides in about 19 minutes, just to be exact, and writing this morning with my colleagues and the leader of our local market, and Kent said, well, if you could do it in 17, that would be great, right? So buckle up, because here we go. Um, it is the largest study of its kind in the world on the topic of trust. We go in 27 markets. We have added markets over the years. Um, this is our 19th year of data we field between the middle of October and the middle of November. It may dawn on you that in the U.S. something happens between the middle of October and the middle of November every couple of years that impact some perceptions, a thing called an election, so we'll talk about that. Um, and we talk about a sample that is comprised of a general online population broken down into an informed public and a mass. General online population. Think of the internet penetration in the US versus India versus Indonesia. So first and foremost, my sample is skewed based on internet penetration in those markets. Secondly, 19 years ago, we could not field this via the internet, phone screener, right? We came up with that, informed public, we made it up. When you're doing the survey, you get to do things like that. Um, 25 to 64, college educated, top 25% household income in that market and they report a significant media consumption and engagement on business news. Do not ask me what significant is. They say yes, we put them in the segment, right? Really important distinction that out of my entire sample, this, this, minus this is this, right? Because that's an important storyline because we're going to compare the opinions of the informed versus the mass. Why did we start with informed? Because as a communications and marketing firm 20 years ago when we started this, or 19 years ago to be exact, opinion and perception started at the top of that pyramid. The elites drove opinion and it filtered down. That is absolutely not the case today, but that's why we started there 20 years ago. Um, a better picture this year, someone said they'd, they'd, stud, they'd been a student of the trust barometer or a fan of it, thank you very much. Um, and that trust was always down. It's up, right? Um, four points across the board for the informed public. Um, about three, give or take, on the general online population. What is trust? For 19 years, we've asked exactly the same question. How much do you trust the institution of non-governmental organizations, the institution of business, the institution of government, and the institution of media to do the right thing? to do the right thing. That's the entire construct as it relates to trust to do the right thing. Pretty simple and straightforward. We do not explain what we mean by uh, meat gut business. We do not explain what we mean by media. Now, consider how the term media has changed over 19 years, right? I think one of the most transformed terms in our study. Um, in China, 80% roughly of the respondents to the trust barometer, trust media to do the right thing. Now, who owns the media in China? What is the media's job in China? So as we talk about different countries, suspend your American perspective or your Western perspective and think about the mindset of, of the respondent. And so while that's a better picture, right, slightly up year over year, um, it's, it's kind of not quite that rosy, right? Here we compare along the 27 markets to the 27 markets, the opinion, uh, the belief of the informed versus the mass. And you can see a 14 point difference 
in the trust index of the respondents in those. What is a trust index? It's just simply the average of those four trust scores on the last slide, right? We take the, four, the trust in the four institutions and average it out. Um, I think of it as a predisposition of a people to trust when they wake up, right? It changes, it's dynamic. If I were to field this tomorrow, it would be slightly different. Depending upon what had happened in the market, it might be dramatically different, right? Um, Japan, after Fukushima Daiichi, the tsunami that hit the um, coastline and took out five of the nuclear reactors, trust was decimated in that market, and it has still not fully recovered. Japan used to be very solidly in the middle, just by anecdotal, right? But here you see um, the highest ever trust inequality in those markets with the asterisk, meaning the informed more trusting than the mass. And just simply, we break down trusters as at a 60 plus trust level, neutrals 50 to 59 and distrusters 49 and below. Look at the size of that green distruster bar compared to that green, right? There is a great deal less trust among the mass population than there is the informed public, right? In the U.S., big rebound, last year this number was here, <laughs> um, up 60, 13-point um, differential in the U.S., right? If I look at that on a horizontal trend line, right? Now, Ben, on the last slide you said 14, and here you say 16. This is 23 markets, not 27, because I don't have tracking data of 27 markets back to 2012. That was a lot of numbers, wasn't it? Right? Um, you see the increase in that gap, right? So that's, a, that's kind of an, a, a, a diverging world view, right? That's 27 markets, right? In the U.S., that's 13, by the way. We know that from the last slide. This is the first time we've done this cut. This is 27 markets. This is comparing women and men. Trust average five points higher, seven points higher. In the US, if I put these glasses on because I have my cheat sheet here because I can't remember that, that number, that gap in trust in business in the US becomes 15. A 15 point differential between men who are at a 62 US respondents and women who are at a 47. So I'd love to hear what the panel thinks about that. Will, a plug for a question. Um, right? And then in the U.S., this will be one of the only U.S. only slides, um, we looked at the difference in Democrat and Republican. And what we mean by only is the qualifying question is which political party did you vote for or intend to vote for in November's congressional midterm election? That is the entire composition of the U.S. respondent set of which 37% said I will vote straight Democrat, of which 25% said I will vote straight Republican. If you weren't in one of those two cohorts, we did not put you in this mix. But I would just want you to look at that different view of the world. That's not a political statement. As marketers and communicators, as business leaders, being able to bridge that divide and bridge that divide is paramount. It's different world views. It's different worldviews, and that's not just, as you see from the data, an American thing. Here's the difference in view on um, uh, industry sector, right? Technology has always been on top. We keep waiting on it to fall, <laughs> candidly, right? I believe, Ben Boyd Editorial, the respondent think of that as hardware. They don't think of that as, social, as Facebook, just to be like a, of a brand, right? They don't think of that as Google. They think of that as, what, you know, what, it, what is this hardware thing, this desktop that's sitting in front of me, or, right? Um, because candidly, don't you think the automotive industry today is a technology industry? I can sit in my car, it can read the lanes, the distance between me, and move my car forward in a traffic jam situation. That, that's high tech. But I think this is illustrative in terms of um, the respondent's perspective on the differences in these industries. There's a 13 point difference between technology and energy. And I think if I sit in those sectors, I need to think about, again, the atmospherics of that perspective. The U.S. Don't, doesn't have dramatically different rank. On any of this that you want U.S. numbers, we can get them, right? But I've got 17 minutes, so I've got to keep going. Um, all of that atmosphere says there's a desire for change, right? Because employees are concerned 60% that they don't have the training, 55% that automation is going to take their job away, or 57% that trade 
trade policies and tariffs are going to hurt the company that I'm working for. If I work for a multinational, that's only more pronounced. In the U.S., these numbers are slightly higher. These numbers are roughly the same. So in the U.S., that knowledge about uh, multinational and the, that kind of global economy is even more pronounced. And that leads to this, which is the percent who believe that they and their families will be better off in five years' time, will be better off in five years' time. If I'm in the mass population in the U.S., that is less than one in two. Less than one in two respondents in the U.S. believe that their family will be better off in five years. If I'm informed, it's 62, right? Um, that U.S. number is right on par with the global average, right? But 14 of 27 markets in which the majority of the mass population do not believe they'll be better off, right? That's, that's a, a, not a very optimistic view. Mostly established economies, if you think about it, like what's the commonality? We kind of look for commonalities in these data points. Mostly emerging, right? New wealth. Maybe it's my, that this first time my family's had a computer and I can participate in this survey. Of course I feel good. I feel bullish, right? That's better. Um, and so all of that boils up for us into a battery of questions around a sense of injustice, desire for change, a lack of confidence and hope to a question or a question set that we pull into an aggregate around the notion of the system, that thing that I'm living within, right? And for the mass population, 46% believe that the system is failing them. Half of them believe the system is failing them. The informed public is four in 10, right? where one in five of both think the system is working for me. The U.S. numbers are basically exactly the same, right, in terms of, in terms of that finding. Um, and so how do we make change happen? Where, where, where is the positive? What is the opportunity, right, to respond to this, to, to lead forward? And I think this is a good news slide. I'll, I'll start with the bad news. 28% of respondents in 27 markets consume news less than weekly. I've had enough. I'm not going to read it. Why is it good news? Because last year it was 49%, <laughs> right? So the new normal sucks, but it's the new normal, and I guess I better start paying attention again, right? And not only should I start paying attention again, but 4 in 10 say I'm not just going to consume it, but I'm going to share and post it and try to be a change agent. How am I going to reach these people through these people, right? This one is worth sharing, a breakout in the U.S., because in the U.S. last year, that number was 55. In the U.S. this year, that number is 39. 40% of Americans still say that they consume less news less than weekly. Amplifiers in the U.S. is 27%, right? And if I pull that number apart, that bar chart apart, there is some differential in the amplifiers in which we see that the increase in amplification among the informed public women went up 23% from 34 to 57%, right? So I, I've had enough, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna say something. And what we'll see in a few minutes um, is that, that what they say matters because one of the people that I trust most is a person like myself, right, is a peer, right? So that, that voice in terms of amplification really matters despite the fact that trust in social media in the U.S., only 34% of respondents have trust for social media, right? 65% for traditional media, 61% for search. 73%, first time we asked this question was in 2016. It's remained north of 70. 73% of our respondents in 27 markets worry about fake news being used as a weapon. Do you realize that four years ago, if we were standing in this room, we would have no concept of what we meant by fake news? No concept of what that term meant in March of 2015. It wasn't until that fall that that term began to have currency. It wasn't until that 2016 that we began to define what that looked like, and subsequently that term has changed. That is the pace of change that we are living through as it relates to uh, perception around media. I would not want to be in the media business today. That's a tough, tough business to be in, right? I think never has it been more important, never has it been more important, because it's fundamental in terms of the trust levels of these folks as they look for information, but it is tough, right? And I think that social continues to struggle 
right? You read the boards around the questions around the changes in Facebook and were they or were they not, right? You, you're, you, you are in that informed mass um, that consume. And so I think all of that leads to this. 76% of people are saying that CEOs should take lead on change rather than waiting because they are looking for someone to lead, right? Up 11 points. Now, if trust is lower in the U.S., it won't surprise you then that this number is 81 in the U.S. 81% of the American respondents are looking for CEOs to say something. And that's not just a general expectation. That is the same when we said, employees, how important is it for your CEO to respond? So there is a desire for leadership in business to speak up, not just by the general public, but by those employees. And by contrast to trust in these institutions, 75% of respondents in 27 markets trust their employer. In the US, that's 80. 80% 80 trust my employer to do the right thing, right? That's not an east-west phenomenon, right? Remember that color coding? The green is the distrusters, the blue are the trusters. I don't recall a slide quite so blue, right? This is a universal belief that my my, my employer is, is, that's the last place, I got to believe them, right? I, that's where I go every single day, right? And I entrust my employer to be a trustworthy source of information about social issues um, on, on, on important topics. 72% on the economy, 58% or nearly 6 in 10 on technology. Be very clear, this is not an Edelman um, commercial to say, CEOs should go out and talk about everything. No, they absolutely should not. <laughs> they should not. That's not what we're saying. We are saying that's the expectation of employees. We are saying that's the expectation of consumers. We are saying you should figure out what you should engage on and you should engage on something that is relevant to your business. To simply be quiet on the sideline is not going to cut it. So I hope that's what you would take from that. Um, and that's because of this. Um, we talked to uh, our respondents about Employees who expect what they expect from a prospective employer. So I'm going to interview for this job, right? And we said when considering an organization as a potential place of employment, how important is each of the following? And we asked about 17 different things, and I'm happy to get those for you. But to simplify, we boiled it into three buckets. There's job opportunity for me, wage growth, training, career. There's personal empowerment. I know what's going on. I'm a part of the culture and I get where we're going. My employer has a greater purpose and my job has meaningful societal impact. In 27 markets, one in four people right there, that 25, said I would never work for an organization that does not offer this. <laughs> That little number to me, talk about, from my vantage point, like we maybe should have rethought the design on this slide because that's the number I want you to look at right there. 25, right? One in four. I won't take that job. Now, that's self-reported behavior, but that's still a mindset that's, you know, massively critical. Does this number surprise me? Oh, I'm going to go to this dead-end place where there's wage stagnation? Not really, right? I kind of think that's the table stakes budget bucket, <laughs> right? I kind of feel like this is the opportunity where, again, I want to be part of a solve. I want to be a contributor, right? And when I believe that my employer is performing against my expectations on a zero to nine scale, my trust on a one to nine scale gets really deep, right? 80, 78%. 8 in 10 respondents, when they believe at a high-end level that the employer is performing, trust at an 8-9 on a 9-point scale, right? And why does that matter? We do an earned brand study. It looks at the notion of the depth of relationship between an individual and a brand, and that brand could be my employer. And when I have strong trust, I advocate for that brand, I am loyal to that brand, I will defend that brand, and I will stay with them through the missteps that they inevitably will take, right? So there is a stability to the relationship that comes from strong trust. And that, again, from a notion of defend and advocate, when a person like myself and a regular employee are at the top four in terms of trusted, credible sources, then I think you can understand in that social peer-to-peer -peer context 
that deep trust and that ability to engage these folks in telling the story of the values is really important because how a company treats its employees is one of the best indicators of trustworthiness. Eight in ten respondents, right? Who am I going to believe about how it, who are you going to believe about how Edelman treats its employees? Probably someone that works at Edelman, right? And so that level of trust is incredibly important in that peer-to-peer -peer dynamic, especially in a world in which, again, vast majority, 73% of the global respondents say a company can take specific actions that both increase profits and improve the economic and social conditions where they operate. In the U.S., that's three and four, right? Up three year over year. So just a growing sentiment globally that these things are not mutually exclusive and in a world in which these other institutions kind of aren't working, like somebody better do something, right? So I, I think that all of that sum, summarizes to say it's a tough environment. Um, it's a tough environment for the truth. Um, the truth has never been more important. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for your attention as I did that speed rendition. Um, and now look forward to the panel conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. I think we've got a little bit to talk about. <laughs> uh, as our panelists take their seat, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. I want to remind everyone that we're live streaming this event. So uh, if there's an area of particular interest that you want to go back and, and see, or if you have a colleague that wasn't able to join us today, I encourage you to go back and, uh, and take a look at that online. Um, I also, in the interest <laughs> in the interest of time, uh, you have full bios of our panelists uh, within your packet. So I'll go ahead and introduce our panel and uh, we will jump right in. Uh, we have on the stage Patrick Kreitzer, who's the president and CEO of Tillamook County Cream Creamery Association. Christy McFarlane, who's the chief strategy officer of New Seasons Market. Lisa Hayamoto, Senior Instructor of Journalism at the University of Oregon, and, and Frank Hotarte, who's the Vice President of Human Resources for Kaiser Permanente in, in the Pacific Northwest region. So uh, I, I think first off, I want to dive into, you know, Ben talked about this, this relationship between employer and employee. And uh, when I think of new seasons, you, you are very much, your employees are your brand. And, and that's how your brand is perceived in the, in the marketplace. So Christy, I, I would love to hear how do you, n number one, how do you listen and how do you project the values of the organization and reflect them back uh, through your, your number one brand asset, your employees? That's a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. Our staff are, um, are the interaction that our customers have with New Seasons Market. So it's, um, you can buy products in a lot of different places, but it's that relationship that really keeps people coming back to their neighborhood grocery store and wanting to have um, a reason to shop somewhere is that person that I know, the cashier that I wait in line for that person, even if their line's a little bit longer because we'll have a conversation and it'll be a real connection. And so um, I think that, you know, that, that question about um, I'll only work someplace that has a social impact or that has a deeper purpose, that 25% was, was fascinating. I wonder what that would be if we asked New Seasons Market employees. I think um, a lot of them, I'm, I'm one, would, would certainly say I'd only work for someplace that has a, a deeper impact. And um, so one of the questions you asked was ways that we listen. And um, I think that we have um, sort of a tenet in our culture about speaking up and listening is one of our really core values. And so we provide a lot of different ways for our staff to, um, to share their point of view or engage in problem solving. And that's things as, as simple as a survey that a lot of companies do, but things like live streaming town halls, having really transparent communication, um, lots of interaction in stores and really bringing um, teams of people together to solve problems together because that's the answers are in the stores the answers are with our staff who are interacting with customers every day 
Frank, I have to believe that, that you, you're in a similar situation. I, I, your uh, physicians, your administrative staff, your nurses, all are the face of the brand. What, what, what do you do? And I know that you've got a mix of, of union representative uh, staff as well as uh, regular non-union non employees. How, what's that dy dynamic like at Kaiser? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in uh, being in the Northwest, we have a new CEO, Ruth Williams Brinkley, and she's really become that trusted advisor. And one of the things that Ruth has done is, is she's really advocated for transparency. So we often tell stories in our organization of good and bad um, because our members and our patients are vulnerable, but it's a learning opportunity. So we, we don't um, kind of hide away from um, adversity. We actually learn from it. And she's been really adamant about, hey, give me a good patient story and give me one where we just, we failed because we need to learn from that. So it's transparency. Some of the other things that we do, because we're very mobile, um, nobody's really at their computer at Kaiser Permanente. So if you think about nurses and pharmacists and medical assistants and so on, we do a lot of um, engagement in terms of rounding. We have huddles with our teams. And in our union environment, we have something called a unit-based team, which is a UBT. So this is where teams in each departments come together and they're solving problems at the ground level. So what we try to really do is um, have those teams in the departments at the ground level solving those problems and, give, and empowering them to do that. So there's many mechanisms that we do. Um, so I think transparency is, is a piece of it. You know, You have to be able to tell the story. It's not always gonna be great. Um, there's going to be some uh, issues that will rise up and then listen. So the rounding, um, the UBTs, um, and, and we, we really started embracing storytelling as well so that people can tell their story. So what was your journey? Why are you at Kaiser? I'm at Kaiser because um, it's a mission driven organization. I think of Kaiser as less of healthcare and more about healthy communities. And so a lot of people who stay with us, I mean, we've got employees who've been with us for 40 plus years, stay because of the mission and, and the community that we, um, we, we serve, so. I'm gonna, while we're on you, I'm gonna ask you this question. Lisa, I would like your impression as well. Ben talked about the fact that, uh, you know, just four years ago, fake news didn't exist. And uh, I know that we've been dealing with a, a measles breakout uh, in Southwest Washington and, and even a couple of cases here in, in Oregon. I, how do you, <laughs> I, I guess in, the, um, in this new environment where fake news is, is uh, impacting people's impression of information just in general, mm -hmm. how do you counter that? How do you use your, your staff and employees to really project out the opinion of the medical com community as you're dealing with this very delicate uh, topic and, and, and critical topic? Yeah, so great question, by the way. Um, so yeah, it's in the news, Southwest Washington. And, and, and I think, again, transparency, you know, it's out there. What are we going to do to, um, to protect our community and our employees and really be transparent about what we'll do? And so we've put different protocol together. I think one of the things that I've noticed about Kaiser in my 19 total years is that we're really great in crisis management. And so it's really about, we put the patient in the center of everything as well. So when this measles outbreak happened, we really um, got together with our infection control group and we put a really diligent plan together to make sure that um, there is protocol in place and that we're really protecting that relationship with the member. Because you talk about a trust, you cannot break that trust with the member. And so we have different protocol and what have you to really address that. I don't know that we've had media reach out to us and, um, and I'm sure they have, but we, we're transparent and like, yes, we're in Southwest Washington. Yes, we have clinics and yes, we're doing what we have to do to um, create a safe environment and, and, and create that um, trust with not only our employees keeping them safe, because they're also members, but our members as well. Lisa, from your perspective, what can, what can media do to regain trust uh, when we have this prevalence of, of fake news impacting people's uh, trust in the information that they have? Certainly. Oh, fake news is such huh. a problematic term. I know. I know. Um, because it doesn't mean news that's fake. It means <laughs> news that you don't like or news that you're unsure of or, and, and not even news. It, it, people really refer to it as just sort of vague information that they're thinking about, but it's really, really damaging. 
um, to journalists and to the media because it's sort of stamping this institution, uh, this media institution with this term that isn't always applicable. So that's my thought on fake news. <laughs> um, but in terms of regaining trust, there's, there's so much to do uh, in the media. Um, but I'm really struck by what you were saying about transparency. And that's been uh, sort of a growing movement within Within media, um, I think a lot of journalists are very surprised to learn that people don't really understand the journalistic process. Uh, to us, it seems very obvious, but uh, if you think about it for just a second, of course it's not obvious. People don't know how we come up with our stories or who we talk to or why we chose them or why we chose this information or where we got it or how we put it all together. Um, and so uh, journalists are trying very hard to sort of open up their notebooks, as it were, and um, sort of talk a little bit more about why they're doing what they're doing, how they're doing, how it all comes together. Because essentially what we've been doing is we're, you know, we're, we're, we're making sausage and we're not showing anyone how the sausage hmm. is made and then asking them to, to trust it, right? I'm really mixing metaphors here. Um, <laughs> I love I a good really mixed metaphor. I can really roll with this. Eat this sausage. Eat it. There you go. Yes, it's delicious. We all ate sausage this And morning. cheese. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, we're, we're finding um, that transparency uh, has been really key in showing people sort of how, how it all works, as well as a number of other things. But. So, you know, I would just add to that is if you don't communicate with your employees, they create their own narrative. Absolutely. So we've had a reorganization and, and one of the employees came back to us saying, oh, you're shutting down this hospital. And we said, no, we're just reorganizing. So people are creating their own realities or their own narratives. That's, that's why it's important to communicate and communicate transparently as well. And I think making room for the, the so much of the issue, I think, right now, in addition to the transparency and, and the, the journalists showing their notes, is understanding time. I think the hopefully the resurgence of long-form journalism that gives us a chance to explore in a deep, deeper, meaningful way, which can't be can't be can't be translated in a tweet. I think is is hmm. something that is desperately needed as well. Uh, Patrick. Your employees are, <laughs> they're watching you and they have high expectations and it's beyond uh, delivering a, a quality product in a work environment. Uh, as a CEO, what does this data, how does this data speak to you? And I guess, how do you decide what you're going to stand for as it aligns with the company, as it aligns with your employees? Uh, you know, you, you, you're a co-op, so you've got that dynamic as well. It's a, it's a, complex uh, operation with high expectations. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, so in terms of the, the, the concept that it, um, people are trusting their employer, maybe at a greater rate than, than they're trusting business or other institutions, it, that's, it feels intuitive to me, that uh, not a surprise in that we're all uh, more trusting of and better able to communicate with and find common ground with people that we know. So, uh, you know, if it's a place I'm going to work every day, I, I, I have, uh, exposure and relationship with leadership and with, with uh, my coworkers, uh, it seems intuitive to me that, that that would be a good foundation for trust. Um, this question of, of businesses or CEOs specifically, um, you know, speaking out on things, I, I think is an interesting one. And it's one that I've actually had an opportunity uh, over the last, you know, several months even to have conversations with other CEOs around the country about and then and then even recently I did some town hall meetings around the company and actually asked some employees about this as well. And, you know, what, what we've tried to do is, um, is, you know, if I'm gonna speak out or we're gonna take a position as a company, there are some obvious things that folks will expect, you know, anything related to ag, you know, for example, or our business, you know, uh, productively engaging in the, in the issue of uh, climate change legislation and, and how we reduce carbon emissions without, uh, you know, putting agriculture out of business, those kinds of things see, seem obvious and people expect that. Um, beyond that, for us, even though we're a national business, um, us, we'll take a position on things that, you know, because we're so firmly rooted in Oregon and we've been here for 110 years, we'll take positions, sometimes taking a little bit of risk on things that we think, just in our judgment, uh, are critically important um, to the state. So adequately funding education, uh, as an example, and so um, you know, I've been out in front on some of those things, just because we feel like um, 
you know, there are some inherent challenges facing the state, opportunity gap for, uh, for children, uh, you know, poor p people of color. Uh, those are things that are critically important for the, the, the state we're in. Um, and generally, as you go beyond that, I, I find that um, as I talk to employees about it, there's a there's there's different reactions. You know, some folks feel like this is important to me, and I want the company to take a stand on it, and and they want me to stand out. Uh, others get uncomfortable because they sort of want to shy away from the risk inherent in that around you know a consumer brand taking a position on a potentially controversial topic so you know it, it's it's complicated um, hmm. but uh, I do think that increasingly um, if we are gonna um, what you know one of our values of the company is genuine care which means that we th we care about and support the entire person that works for the company not just uh, a folk with a f with more than a focus on just their contribution to the company and so if um, if we're going to take that seriously then issues like um, gender discrimination, uh, other forms of institutionalized uh, discrimination and barriers that are put up for people that they're, that our employees are dealing with outside of the company, then we're going to need to increasingly take take a position uh, on some of those things. The other thing I'll mention is just that you know there, there's a lot there's some of these high profile CEOs with a lot more voice than I have that take a position or want to speak out against things. I think that also has to be built on. A foundation of the actions that the person and the company are taking as well. Um, Tim Boyle is a great example of this with the investments he's made in homelessness. He's spoken out against, uh, you know, or at least raised the issue of homelessness in Portland and how difficult it is to do a business, but he's also personally uh, contributing to solutions related to homelessness. So I think, um, you know, as CEOs find their voice, they need to also ensure that they're taking the actions to support uh, the kind of solutions that, that are available. Let, I want to. You, you said something about listening to the employees and when they they raise issues that are important. One of the other things that we've seen recently, and I'll open this up to to you as well as the other panelists. Um, it last, I think it was last Monday, the Seattle Times had a story where uh, Amazon moms or uh, Amazon employees that are mothers uh, had signed a petition uh, saying that they wanted better secondary uh, childcare. Uh, and, and we're demanding that from Amazon. We also, if you if you listen, there's a great um, New York Times podcast, the the Daily, that did a segment last week about uh, engineers that were developing the Hololens uh, when they found out that it was being used by the U.S. Army. You know, they 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 were saying this isn't really how we were designing this product to, to begin with. How do you balance the voice of employees because they're feeling emboldened uh, and, and ensuring that. It, that when you do speak out, you're you're really speaking on behalf of of your your customers and all of your employees, which there may not be full agreement on. Yeah, well, it's messy business for sure. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I would say you know you think about a consumer brand like ours. We've got the consumer, we've got uh, employees, we've got uh, we're owned by farmers, and so we've got that constituency. And you know the the thing the the approach is briefly the approach that I think makes the most sense is you just wade into the messiness of it. I mean, you just have the conversations. You're as transparent as as other folks said as as you can be about it, and you just make the decision that you think makes the most sense. And uh, when you make mistakes, you 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 own that. But you know what I find is that um, there's much made today, uh, particularly in the media, about the differences of opinion that I don't think we have any. I mean, my my uneducated opinion on this is that we don't have any more differences of opinion than we did. We're just kind of, gra one, we're grappling with some of the issues that have kind of plagued our economy and our nation for a long time that we need to deal with now. And then the other thing is, it's good, it's good media. It's good, uh, you know, it's good media to, to kind of speak to the polar edges of, of the issue. And so um, I think when you have rational conversations in the middle, um, we find that the outcomes that we all want are not that different and how we get there is maybe where the disagreement is. I just want to throw one last thing in there, which is that, um, you know, I'm not, sh you know, I hate to say this, I, I may cause a little bit of controversy here, but um, I'm not sure less engagement weekly in the media is a bad thing right now <laughs> because I'm not sure it's helping. Um, you know, we're, our brains are wired to be drawn to, uh, I love the analogy of the lion in the bushes rather than the fruit on the trees because uh, that's what we, you know, need to pay attention to, and so that's all we're being talked, you know, all we're being told. And each of us has a responsibility if we're consuming media weekly or otherwise to find.
the facts. Um, I think, you know, somebody, I was at a conference recently and one of the speakers said, objectively by any measure you can come up with, we're better off today than, than, uh, than we were ever, ever at any time in history. Now, I can't validate that, but that feels like it probably is true. And yet you would not know it from listening to the media. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah can I jump in? I yeah, think, please. Um, I think businesses do have social impact, whether you're intentional about that or not, right? So there's there's always a ripple effect. Okay. Oh, we'll share. Great. Um, so the, uh, businesses always have a social impact, right? It's it's whether you're intentional about that and and how clear you are about the ripple effects of of your business. Um, and we're in a similar position of uh, customers, staff, community members, vendors. There's just this wide constituency that we're working with. And so um, we do intentionally think about where to weigh in, where can we um, have a positive impact, and it's got to be in alignment with action that we're actually taking. So um, to be vocal about something without uh, having skin in the game is, is not really helpful. So. Uh, we have a mission council that's made up of staff internally that helps us think through where do we um, take a public policy stance on something like um, the minimum wage in Oregon was something that was really important to us and, and where we wanted to stand up and um, advocate for um, retail workers uh, across industries, right? Uh, um, not just our own, but for the state overall. Things like um, advocacy in the food system is really important to us. Um, and the idea of um, alleviating hunger and um, reducing food waste and having environmental impact, all those types of things, we have to be clear about um, when we take a stand, being able to have really clear action and goals around that and be transparent about what's working, what's not working, where we're making an impact, where we're missing the mark. That came up in the discussion yesterday that if you take a stand where there may be difference of opinion, yep. purity of intent, and the dialogue that you have so that people understand the context. And if you've built that level of trust, even if they disagree, they may go with you on that journey if you've taken the time to involve them. So I, I think you're absolutely right, that's, that's critical. Yeah, I would just add that you, you can take a stand, but you know, actions speak louder than words, right? So you talked about investment, and that's where, for us, um, being a healthcare organization, but being very mission driven, we invest in housing, homelessness, education. We also invest in our employees because we hear that from our employees. They're worried about automation just like any other industry. And so years ago, we went to an automated uh, uh, medical record system. And so we did a lot of training for coders. And so we're reinvesting back into the employees. And so we listen and then we make thoughtful decisions um, because it's so complex. and. Uh, you have the brand to worry about, and then legal counsel telling you what you can and can't do half the time. But but it's about taking action, and and, and it's authentic, right? So you can say I'm taking a, a a position on this, but what action are you taking to support that? And I know our our CEO at the corporate level, Bernard Tyson, is very visible and taking you know proactive steps and outside of even just the healthcare realm. And so here locally, we're proud of our three to PhD programs. We're proud of the housing investments. And we're also proud of investing in our staff because the workforce is continuously evolving. And um, you know, people are worried about that. I think that was part of your slide in terms of automation. And so it's just about taking action. That's absolutely my uh, two cents. <laughs> I'll, I'll just speak really uh, quickly to sort of the mission-driven aspect that you all have touched on. Um, this is something I see every day in my students. Um, of course, you know, my students are looking for jobs that are going to be sort of creatively and personally rewarding and that where they're going to have opportunity. But certainly what I have heard loud and clear, especially in the last few years, is that it's very, very important to sort of tomorrow's workers to be involved in an organization that, that they think does good um, and that they're part of a mission. And I think that um, that's just going to continue. And I think it behooves us all to, to really harness that, right? Um, and of course, I have to talk about news engagement, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I will say that um, I, I think that that sort of uh, the news can be really overwhelming and that people opt out for sort of like self-care reasons. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that uh, informed publics are more trusting. And I think that has to do with knowledge and control, 
right? If we feel like we understand what's going on, we feel like we have more control over what's going on, and it would, it would kind of make sense that we then trust sort of the institutions around us a bit more because we know how they work. Um, I think there's probably, you know, a saturation point where you start to feel like you know too much, um, and now you've kind of, you've, you've dropped over the edge. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, knowledge, uh, knowledge can lead to trust. Let's dive a little bit deeper on, on that topic. I, you know, I've always been taught in school and in history and political science classes that democracy as we know it really depends on a strong fourth estate. And uh, you know, looking at the data and looking at the variety of new ways that we're being thrown information constantly, I guess the question for the entire panel is, is that fourth estate broken? And if it is, how do we, how do we navigate out of that? A little easy I'll question, I'll right? I'll certainly start, yeah, I'll, I'll start on that one. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is no, it's not, it's not broken, um, but the long, ish, I won't go too long, answer, of course, is more complicated. Um, I mean, we're seeing a, a resurgence of trust uh, in the media. We're seeing it, um, sadly, only in certain populations. Um, and that's something that journalists are very, very aware of. Um, but I think one of the things that you just have to talk about when you're talking about the fourth estate is, is sort of the business side of things. And um, the business model for media is certainly breaking and in some cases broken, right? And if you can't pay for it, if you can't make it happen, then it, then it can't happen. So that's what we're seeing. Um, we're seeing sort of the hollowing out of, of local and regional news. And I think that has a huge implication on trust because we, we trust what we know, what we see, what we can personally verify, especially anymore, right? And if, uh, for example, you go to the high school football game and you see that teams such and such win, wins, won, and uh, you know, so and so got injured and this thing happen, right? And then we see it reflected in our news. There's just a really subtle thing that happens where we're like, yep, news, that's a thing that happens and it's true and I trust it, hmm. right? But if we aren't seeing our lives or our experiences reflected in our news, in our media, and what we're getting feels so abstract and so far away from us, there's gonna be a huge trust gap there. And because the, uh, the business models have been failing, right? Advertising-based business models aren't working like they used to. Um, you know, print circulation is not working like it used to. Um, then people aren't having that sort of, sh they're, they're not seeing their experience, they're not seeing their lives. Um, national media, of course, is, is thriving. Um, there are some aspects of, of media that are thriving in both a business sense and in sort of a, sort of a trust and, and impact sense. Um, but it's that, it's everything underneath that that is what keeps me up at night. Ben baited us with a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a question regarding this uh, sudden rise in engagement and amplification of women uh, over, over men. I just, any thoughts on what's driving that, that sudden increase within that population? <laughs> Maybe a focus group of two. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that there's uh, a, a lot of women are feeling very empowered and they're feeling seen and heard in a way that they weren't before. Um, and when you feel seen and heard, you yeah, you want to engage in in the world more. Um, it makes sense that you would want to retreat from you know, areas of, of existence that didn't seem to validate who you were and what your experience was. Yeah, and I think um, there was also a comment there that you trust people who are, are like you, right? And um, the more women in leadership, I think, creates an ability to have more women's voices in leadership. Um, same with, I think, a lot of different populations when the, when the nature of a leadership team changes then more voices are at the table, which is fantastic, and it starts a different kind of dialogue. And I think more people then can say this, this issue is also important to me, um, and it gains some momentum. I have two college-age daughters, and I, I think it's been so inspiring for me to see how emboldened they feel in seeing women have a voice in leadership and business, 
in politics, and it just seems to be an exciting time. And I, it's it's made me really pleased that they're as a result. I think they feel empowered to have a voice as well. Um, thank you all. I would like to open it up to the to the uh, all the participants if there are questions. I think we have a microphone that's roaming. If you have a question for the panelists, I kind of like this microphone. I feel like we're on NPR or something. <laughs> Questions yeah, from the exactly. floor. Yeah. Worse. Yes, Senator. <laughs> Grill someone. Yeah. Yes. Patrick expressed a difference in communicating with employees, some kind of looking for that leadership voice on political issues and some expressing discomfort with that. Um, and that's something I've felt in my workplaces as well. And I've had leadership express that that's like a generational divide between those two camps. Mm, and I can imagine it's far more complex than that power dynamics and wealth and education. But I wonder if the panelists could just speak to their experience with that divide. I, I would just say from my experience, it's um, there's, um, we have a female CEO and she's diverse, African-American. We have a very diverse leadership team. So it feels like there's a safer environment for people to speak up. Um, especially if you're a minority. So we see a lot of more females and minorities speaking up more because they see at the highest level that our, our CEO's female, our CFO's female, our COO's female, um, and we have a great diversity. So there's more kind of a safe space for people to speak up, whereas maybe in the past people didn't feel safe. So I don't know the generational divide piece, but what I can speak to is in our environment because we have such a, um, we, we were about 70% um, plus female, just general population of workforce. But when they see that s senior leadership team kind of look like me, I feel safe to speak out or speak up. And so that's what we're seeing in our organization. Ben, ben talked about, you know, because the data says there's an expectation, it doesn't mean that you speak out on everything. And I think that uh, resisting that we've worked with clients that all of a sudden want to stand we've got to stand up for everything uh and, and i think being true to the organization and really that i think it's come up as a theme here as far as the 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 dialogue with employees and, and really determine what's truly mission aligned to the organization uh so that when you do take a stand that stand is you know you, number one can be acted upon i think that you had mentioned that earlier on uh, and, and two, that you've engaged in enough of a dialogue that if there is disagreement, you can move forward with confidence because you've, you've had that conversation. I, I, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I haven't experienced it as generational difference, um, but I would say that the younger generations definitely stay on it longer, you know, hold you more accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think the, the desire to engage and to be civically active or socially responsible doesn't seem to cut across um, generational lines from, from my experience, but I do think that there's sort of, and, and what are we gonna do about it? That voice um, does seem louder. I think there, there has been a shift in, um, in, the, in, in sort of moving from, uh, I expect my company to have a clear set of values that are expressed uh, in ways that it treats me to I expect my company to have uh, positive impact on the world generally and the opportunity for me to express my own values through the work that I'm doing. And so to, I think anecdotally probably, but to some degree it is a bit generational because there, you know, those of us that have been in the workforce for decades maybe didn't have that expectation. And so I think it's a general expectation now that's growing uh, among all of us that work for companies um, that, that we have that kind of alignment with our company. Um, but because, you know, Folks, there's folks in the workforce now that have only experienced that or had that expectation uh, from early parts of their career. I think there is some sort of generational skew. Well, and the dynamics, dynamics have shifted, right? We, we found this in the trust data four or five years ago that through social media channels, we saw this dispersion of authority. So I think it, it there was a time where you could hide as senior leadership, and I, I think that mm -hmm. that that's no longer true. I, I think that dialogue is happening around you and you either choose to participate in it or it controls you. And so I, I, I think, in, you know, there, I can see the, the resistance, but the, the days have changed in which you can sit back and be quiet because I think the expectation of the voice has changed. Other questions? Oh, come on. 
There's a question for Lisa. One of the things we've seen across the country is the disappearance of local, local newspapers in many areas of the country. So we now have large swaths of the country that are actually information deserts where there is no local journalism, no newspaper, probably no local television station. And I'm wondering if you're seeing A, what the impact is of that, and B, if you have any thoughts as to how that might be addressed in terms of serving those areas. Uh, yes, absolutely. That that's just absolutely a huge issue. Um, yes, as you as you noted, we call them news deserts, where there's just absolutely no local news. Um, but another concern is uh, what are called ghost newspapers, which are newspapers. And newspapers, it's important to note, um, generally provide most of the original information in any sort of news ecosystem. So they're um, they're kind of canaries in in coal mines in that way. Um, but we were seeing a rise in so-called ghost newspapers, which are newspapers that have been so starved for resources that they're not able to adequately cover their communities. So you've got a news organization, right? But it's not able to do what it's intended to do. Um, we are seeing some, I mean, we're first of all seeing like a growing awareness of that. Um, and the pressing need there is, of course, I mean, like I mentioned before, if you're, if you're not seeing news that reflects your life and your concerns, then you're either going to disengage from news or you're going to, your, your distrust in, in, in news is going to increase. Um, and again, you know, if, if, if you're only engaging with information that feels very far away from you and you feel powerless and you feel like it's very abstract, that's going to increase that distrust as well. We are seeing, I mean, I see some of my students who um, they graduate and, you know, of course we've got students who graduate with dreams of the New York Times and CNN and NBC and all of that, but I'm seeing a lot of students who are saying, no, I want to serve a small rural community because that's where I feel like I can make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing an increase in um, sort of small, for example, nonprofit news organizations and sort of scrappy media organizations mm -hmm. who are trying to do a lot with a little. Um, and journalists have always been very, very mission driven. Um, but I think for a lot of journalists, particularly young journalists, um, they, they really want that, that mission, that sense of mission is amplified and they're wanting to do it in a way that's less personal glory and more sort of public service. Um, and it's really heartening. Great. I think we are actually at time. So I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Ben. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, and I, you know, if you have further questions, if you go to the Edelman website, uh, there are reams of data that go much deeper. And I, we're in the midst of, you know, it was first released at Davos just three or four weeks ago. So now we're at that point where we're doing a deeper dive into areas like employee experience and other categories. So if this has sparked interest, I would encourage you to uh, get in touch with the team here in Portland. And uh, we look forward to con continuing the conversation. So thank you all again for participating. Selfie? No. Sitting?